Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are enjoying your time and learning a whole lot while you're here. My name is Colleen Brock. I am the regional manager for the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I have been here for three months officially, but I have been a volunteer for almost 22 years. So I've been around the block. Anyway, before we get started, I want to talk about the surveys we conduct to evaluate your IDF national conference experience. You should have received an email prior to the conference with a survey link. We thank you for completing that pre-conference survey. We'll also be notifying you post-conference with a survey where you can provide feedback on this session and all sessions you attend. After the conference, you will be notified through the conference app and you will receive an email to complete that survey. We thank you in advance for doing this. It's very important. Your feedback is absolutely vital as we understand the true impact of our conference. Questions will be answered at the end of this discussion. You have index cards on the table. Please write your questions on these cards. We will pick them up closer to the end of the discussion. The presenter will then answer as many questions as possible during the session time. So now it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Health and Life Management session. It's complicated, the relationship between autoimmunity and immunodeficiency. The session will be presented by Dr. Kathleen Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan serves as the Chief of the Division of Allergy and Immunology within the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She is the Vice Chair of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee and Co-Principal Investigator on the US IDNet Steering Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sullivan. Colleen just wished me good luck. I wonder what that means exactly. <laughs> Are you an especially rowdy group? Is that what's going to happen here? Um, I wish you'd been a little more uh, forthcoming in why that was a good thing. My name, as she said, is Kate Sullivan, and we're going to talk about autoimmunity. And one of the pieces of advice that Colleen gave me when I was coming up is that treatment is often a little bit complicated, a little bit challenging if you have a PI, right? Sometimes people say, oh, we, we can't really treat your autoimmune disease. I'm going to talk about why that's not true. I'm going to talk about why people get autoimmune disease, and there's um, sadly going to be a little lesson about the immune system along the way. So let's get started. Um, just to reiterate, there are index cards on your table, and so if you have a question, please, you know, give me a challenging one. Give me something to chew on. Okay, so what is autoimmune disease? This is the first thing that I think people get wrong. People think people, and here I mean doctors, um, people tend to think that autoimmune disease is too much of the immune system, and immune deficiency is too little of the immune system. It's not true. Autoimmunity is when the immune system makes a mistake. It's when the immune system takes a left turn instead of a right turn. It has nothing to do with quantity. What is autoimmunity in real terms? What are we talking about? What types of diseases and conditions are we referring to when we talk about autoimmune diseases? So there's organ-specific autoimmunity, so things like thyroid disease. I know lots of people in the room probably have thyroid disease because statistically, it's the most common autoimmune disease in the US. Psoriasis, a skin condition that's autoimmune. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, arthritis, not old age arthritis, but inflammatory arthritis, where there should be a treatment that addresses inflammation. Inflammatory bowel disease, I'm going to come back to at the end. It has a slightly different etiology and it has a little bit of a different story, but I'll come back to that at the end because it's a great example of how we've come so far in our therapy for autoimmune diseases. So that's organ-specific autoimmunity. There's also whole body autoimmunity, if you can believe it. So examples of systemic autoimmune diseases are things like systemic lupus erythematosus, sometimes called lupus, something called Sjogren's syndrome. So this tends to be where people make autoantibodies to things on every cell, and it can manifest in a variety of different ways. So you can think about autoimmune disease as some of the things that I've mentioned here. Of course, there's lots of other examples, but just to give you some sense of what kinds of things we're talking about here. Well, here comes the lesson in the immune system. Now, I think you've gotten some of this already today, depending on what session you went to, but I did want to go through it because I think it's hard to understand what autoimmunity is until you have a grasp of how the immune system is put together. So really, our immune system does two things, and two things only. So it's meant to attack foreign things, 
and it's meant to not attack self. Don't attack self. Those are the two things that the immune system is wired to do. It seems super simple, right? Um, how can it go wrong in so many different ways? But indeed, it does go wrong, and it's because there are a multitude of cells, proteins, bits of DNA that have to collaborate and execute this complicated choreography to get it right. So I'm just going to say a few words about that. I think the immune system does have incredibly beautiful choreography, but the complexity means that there are lots of ways that it can go wrong. So let's start by dividing the immune system into two compartments. There's the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. Starting with the innate immune system, because it's a little bit easier and also because it has fewer problems with it. So the innate immune system really relates to white cells, but not just all white cells, specifically neutrophils and monocytes. Now probably many of you in the room have heard your doctor talk about neutrophils. Oh, your neutrophils are a little high this time. Oh, your neutrophils are a little bit low. These are parts of your innate immune system. And these cells have receptors which recognize patterns on pathogens, either viruses or bacteria, sometimes fungi. And these receptors are like a key in a lock. It's very, very specific. And they're hardwired. It's how we are all put together. And for the innate immune system, we are mostly all put together the same way. So there's very few ways in which the innate immune system can go wrong because it is hardwired. In contrast, the adaptive immune system requires a lot of training to function. And not everyone's training is exactly right. So the adaptive immune system, when we talk about that, we're really talking about T cells and B cells. Now, I would wager more people in the room have heard their doctors talk about their T cells and B cells, because just statistically, the most common primary immunodeficiencies affect the T cells and B cells. So let's just talk a little bit about how these cells can go wrong. So some cells can go down a bad path. These cells require education, as I said, in order to become fully functional. And it's not always a happy story. So lots of folks with adaptive immune deficiencies get autoimmunity. It does also happen for people who have innate immune deficiencies. And let's just talk a little bit about that. It's actually less common for the innate immune deficiencies. So one of the most common ones is chronic granulomatous disease, and there's been a special session here on chronic granulomatous disease. About 30 to 50% of patients with chronic granulomatous disease will get inflammatory bowel disease. But what's interesting is that they don't have a higher rate in general of autoimmunity. So they're not getting every type of autoimmune disease. They're really just getting one type of autoimmune disease. And that's pretty characteristic of the innate immune deficiencies. So most innate immune deficiencies are not associated with autoimmunity, and I'm actually not going to come back to them in this talk. The innate immune system is hardwired. Those locks and keys, they don't vary very much from person to person, so there's not as many opportunities to make a mistake. So the innate immune deficiencies, with the exception of inflammatory bowel disease, are for the most part not associated with a higher rate of autoimmunity. I just said that. So in the adaptive immune deficiencies, the story is completely different. So let's take a look at how this education really impacts on the risk of autoimmunity. So B cells are born in the bone marrow. Actually, that's why they're called B cells, if you ever wondered. It's because they're born in the bone marrow. And each has an assignment. Each is built with a receptor. But some of those receptors are self-reactive, meaning they are fully capable of attacking our own bodies. Those self-reactive B cells are supposed to be removed in the bone marrow before they ever get out and can cause problems. But that system is not altogether perfect. So here's a little picture trying to explain that there are autoreactive B cells that are born in the bone marrow, but they should be deleted. They should be removed. We have a couple of safety nets in our body in case that doesn't happen, and we know that the system isn't perfect, that there are autoreactive B cells that get into the peripheral blood of all of us. If you are not immune deficient and you're in this room, all of us have some autoreactive B cells. So the system isn't perfect. And so we have these two safety nets. You're going to hear me talk about a cell called a regulatory T cell, and the easiest way to think about it is sort of a fireman. So the regulatory T cell runs around the immune system looking for autoimmunity to stamp out. And it actually does that. When it sees autoimmunity, it actually puts down its foot and it stamps out the autoimmune disease. The other way we have a safety net is that B cells need T cells to go ahead and make antibody. And specifically, they require for the T cell to agree 
that whatever it is they're attacking should be attacked. They have to have agreement between the two cells. So that's our other safety net. So what can go wrong? Lots of things can go wrong with the system. You can already appreciate how much more complicated it is than the innate immune system. The adaptive immune system is just a lot more complicated. So what can go wrong? One thing that we have learned over about the past 10 years is infections all by themselves, even in people with stone cold normal immune systems, infections increase the risk of autoimmunity. Well, shoot, everyone here in the audience has had infections, and you have probably had a lot of infections. So that's one driving force between the high rate of autoimmune disease in people with PI. It's just the frequency of infections. And you can think of it as the immune system is running so hard to attack these infections, just like when you're asked to do too much at work, you're much more liable to make a mistake. Same thing in the immune system. The harder it works, the faster it's running, the more likely it is to make a mistake. Well, another mechanism which is associated with B cells specifically, which is antibody deficiencies, is that B cells can be intrinsically unable to distinguish self from foreign. So if the B cells are a little bit wonky, they're not as strong as they should be, not only are they having trouble with the attack, attack, attack part of the story, they're also having trouble with the protect, protect, protect part of the story. If the B cells are wonky, they make mistakes in both directions. So if you're having trouble making antibodies, your B cells are also having trouble deciding what should I not make antibodies to. And that's another mechanism by which the risk of autoimmunity is high in people with B cell problems. And then in a minute I'm gonna talk about T cell problems, which are actually pretty much part and parcel the same as B cell problems. But it's the same story. Remember I said T cells are sort of our safety net for our B cells so the B cells won't make a mistake. Well, if the T cells are wired wrong, if the T cells are also not doing a good job of distinguishing self, protect, 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 from attack, 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 then of course they're gonna deliver the wrong information to the B cell. So these are three major mechanisms by which people with antibody problems have an increased susceptibility to autoimmune disease. So people with antibody problems get a lot of autoimmune disease. You didn't need me to tell you that. You're in this room because you already know that. Well, let's just take a look at some of the things that can happen. So if we take the purest, simplest antibody deficiency, which is X-linked A gamma globulinemia, you can see some of the rates of autoimmune disease here. So 11 to 15% get arthritis and 5% get inflammatory bowel disease. There's a smattering of other things. There's a few people that get diabetes, a few, things that get a few patients that get thyroid disease, but these are the most common things to happen. So even in a very simple circumstance where the B cells aren't born and they don't make antibody, you still get autoimmune disease for all the reasons that I mentioned. Let's look at a more complicated story. So common variable immune deficiency has one of the higher rates of autoimmune disease. About 20 to 25% of people with common variable get autoimmune disease. And I've listed the frequencies. This is based on one study. There are other studies that have similar numbers, but maybe a bit different. There's autoimmune lung disease, platelet autoimmunity, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, autoimmune hair loss, thyroid disease, lupus, vasculitis. I actually could have listed about 10 more things, but I fell off the bottom of the slide. This is really different than the story with innate immune deficiencies, right? Here, the risk of all autoimmunity is higher. We're not talking about one association. We're saying the risk of all autoimmune disease is higher in this condition. And indeed, that makes it one of the more challenging disorders to treat. So if we sort of summarize common variable, there's one recent message, and I think you heard this from Troy Torgerson today, about 10 to 20% of patients with common variable immune deficiency don't have plain old garden variety common variable. They have common variable due to a single gene defect. Now it's not the majority of patients, so what do I mean by that? The majority of patients with CVID have CVID like people have arthritis, like people have diabetes. It runs in families. We know there's a genetic component, but it's not necessarily the only driving force for that person to have CVID. About 10 to 20% of the time, it's actually a different story. That person inherited one gene, and that one gene is causing their CVID. Well, this has been really revolutionary in the treatment of autoimmune disease for people with CVID. And the reason is, if we know the gene, we know the treatment that works. How revolutionary is that? So let me just give you uh, one example. So among the single gene defects that are causing CVID, a gene called CTLA-4 is one of the most common. 
Look at the rates of autoimmune disease associated with CTLA-4 deficiency. It's about double or triple what I showed you for the general CVID community. Inheriting this gene absolutely ramps up your risk of autoimmune disease. And look at the types of problems. Autoimmune lung disease, autoimmune cytopenias, which means platelets, red cells, any type of cell. Autoimmune GI disease, endocrine problems, arthritis, and something you haven't seen on a slide yet, autoimmune CNS disease, autoimmune diseases of the brain. So someone raised this in the last session I was in. It is, as you can imagine, one of the most troubling types of autoimmune disease. This is really devastating for people that get it. And here's the thing. We know how to treat all of these in people who have CTLA-4 deficiency. We know that sirolimus or a beta sept work great. We wouldn't normally use these in CVID, but for this specific gene, we know that these treatments work. Imagine how revolutionary this is. Well, let's leave B cells for a minute and move into T cells. I don't want to give short shrift to T cells. So T cells are called T cells because they get their education in the thymus. You can tell how simple immunologists are because, you know, we're not that clever at naming things. So T cells are called T cells because they grow up in the thymus. But it's the same concept that I mentioned about B cells. This education is meant to weed out the autoreactive T cells. And there are safety nets for T cells too. So most of the autoreactive T cells are eliminated in the thymus, but not all, a few escape, but we have some safety nets. So remember those uh, immunologic firemen, the regulatory T cells that are going out and stamping out autoimmune disease. So those are helpful here too. And the other safety net for T cells is that they require a second signal. Remember B cells needed the T cells to vet the danger. T cells need a cell of the innate immune system to vet the danger. And so T cells have safety nets too. Well, what can go wrong? So one of the things that was most instructive was when we learned about this immune deficiency. And I, I did take a quick look at the people that had signed up for the meeting this year. I don't think anyone with this particular condition has uh, signed up for the meeting. But there's an immune deficiency called APSED, terrible name, but that's what it is. And you can see the rates of autoimmune disease. Having punky T cells is an extraordinary risk for developing autoimmunity. You can see that people with APSED, where they can't train their T cells properly in the thymus gland, get incredibly high rates of autoimmune disease across every conceivable organ of the body. So I mention it not because it's a common immune deficiency, but because it's taught us a great deal about how important that training is in the thymus. Well, I'd love to show this picture because I feel like I'm always portraying the immune system in negative terms. They're making mistakes. The cells are wonky. Um, but I actually think the immune system is incredibly beautiful. And so this is a T cell being told to go out and fight. So the pink ball is the T cell, and that sort of teal cell with all the fingers around it, that's the cell of the innate immune system that's giving the assignment to the T cell, saying, yes, you should go out and fight. And I do think there is a beauty to the immune system that we sometimes forget because we're always complaining about how wrong it goes. So I've talked about regulatory T cells as sort of the firemen of the immune system, how they stamp out autoimmune disease. There are people who have defects in their regulatory T cells. This is a condition called IPEX. And you can see the incredibly high rates of autoimmunity when the regulatory T cells are wonky. Now, in IPEX, the regulatory T cells don't exist at all. The thing that they've inherited has actually prevented their regulatory T cells from developing. And so, of course, their autoimmune disease is going to be astonishingly high. I show this not because I think there's necessarily anyone in the audience with IPEX, but because there are lesser defects of these regulatory T cells that occur in many patients with T cell defects, and indeed some patients with common variable. And although the, um, the rates of autoimmunity are not as high, having a defect, any defect in your regulatory T cells raises your risk of all autoimmune disease. Again, you know, look across the spectrum. All organs can be affected, so it raises the risk of all autoimmune disease. Well, I mentioned that you can have lesser defects in regulatory T cells, so some of the types of T cell defects affect education in the thymus. I gave you the most extreme example of that. Poor regulatory T cells, again, I gave you the most extreme example of that, but almost all T cell defects have some element of both of those problems. 
There's also a problem where people with T cell defects don't make very many. The T cells aren't very strong, they don't survive as long, so the, just the number of T cells is lower. And this turns out to be a risk for autoimmune disease all by itself. And why is that? It's this concept, again, of the overworked cell. If those T cells are trying to do double duty because there aren't enough of them, they are more likely to make a mistake. So this group with T cell defects has a very high rate of autoimmune disease. So some of the immune deficiencies we know better as syndromes. So I've been talking about T cell defects as sort of a collective entity. Of course there are differences across different defects. I wanted to just mention three of them because I might not have mentioned otherwise that they are T cell defects. So Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, ataxia telangiectasia, DeGeorge syndrome. These are all T cell defects. And again, I could have gone on and on. I just wanted to list a few that I thought you might have heard of. And again, look at these rates of autoimmune disease, incredibly high. So all T cell defects have a quite high rate of autoimmune disease, just like all B cell defects have a very high rate of autoimmune disease, and it's all types of autoimmunity. It's not just a thing. Well, here's where it gets interesting. Can autoimmune disease be prevented? Wouldn't that be lovely? So we know someone has an immune deficiency. What are we going to do to get on board and prevent autoimmunity? What can be done? Um, you'd actually be surprised. In the last five years, there's a little bit of data on this subject. So remember way back 20 slides ago, I said infections all on their own raise the risk of autoimmunity. Well, the treatment for any patient with primary immune deficiency usually as the main cornerstone is the prevention of infection. And that turns out to be really key for the prevention of autoimmune disease across all populations, not just people with PI, but across all populations. Minimizing infection does lower the risk of autoimmune disease. I often get asked about probiotics, and probiotics have been demonstrated to be useful specifically in the prevention and or treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. They've also been demonstrated, interestingly, to be useful for allergic conditions. And we know that allergies are also increased in people living with PI. There's not been a good study of using probiotics in people with PI, and I think there's some fear that probiotics might be dangerous. In fact, probiotics have a long history of being used in immune deficiency, so it is an option. How do probiotics work? We have no idea. But um, here is something to bear in mind. I wish I had a better answer than that. Um, you have probably heard, it's been in a number of newspapers and I think in Time Magazine, that um, for some types of GI tract disease, people are doing fecal transplants. If you haven't heard of it, it's actually exactly what it sounds like. It seems so gross, but if you're desperate, you're desperate, right? If you have terrible intestinal disease, you will eat other people's poop, and that's really what it is. And so how does that work? It turns out, I guess I should have given you a moment for that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it turns out it works. It works for people with chronic GI infections. It works for people with chronic GI autoimmune disease. And why does that work? Our immune system actually tunes the bacteria in our gut, and our gut in turn tunes the immune system. Remember those regulatory T cells? It turns out the bacteria in our gut actually turn on those regulatory T cells. We have to have the right bacteria in the right place in our gut for it all to work swimmingly well. So we don't actually understand what we're doing with these fecal transplants, but they're fairly popular. If you haven't heard of them, I urge you to go online because there's actually DIY versions of it. Not recommended. Um, but there are a number, I'm just saying, um, there are hospitals that do it so that you don't have to actually eat it. They'll deliver it for you. Um, and they're vetted so that it's healthy. There's just no way to make it sound good. It, it's um, a it's, uh, healthy poop. And so um, it does work. And so the idea behind probiotics is let's short circuit that and give people a nice little capsule. It's actually not as effective as the fecal transplants because I think we're not very smart about what's important and what's not in these fecal transplants, but the probiotics do work. And if you have been afraid to take them because you have PI, please don't. There are very few patients with PI who cannot take probiotics, and they do have a place in the armamentarium. What about lung disease? So it turns out that lung disease all by itself is very strongly associated with rheumatoid arthritis. 
Now, I have heard some people say that their doctors are afraid to treat rheumatoid arthritis because of the immune deficiency. That's not true. I'm going to come to another slide where I talk about specific therapy in a minute. These autoimmune diseases must be managed. They're a terrible drain on quality of life. We must manage them as well as we manage the immune deficiency. But let me come back to the lung disease. For reasons that are a little complicated, it turns out that having lung disease of any nature raises your risk for rheumatoid arthritis. This was actually first described in the 1930s, believe it or not, when train engineers that inhaled a lot of coal dust were getting lung disease and coming down almost uniformly with rheumatoid arthritis. So we've known this for a long time, although the chemistry and cell biology was only just worked out. Well, why am I mentioning this? A number of people with PI do have lung disease. It's really important to keep that managed and not let it linger. For a few diseases, so moving on to the next topic, moving, for a few diseases, we actually do preemptive bone marrow transplants. And that's extreme for most people in the audience, but you should know that we understand that autoimmune disease has such a pronounced effect on prognosis, on quality of life, that for the people who have terrible autoimmune disease, we are now doing transplants before they get autoimmune disease to stave it off. And then I just want to come back to this concept of gene, knowing the gene to target therapy. There's increased use of sequencing. I'm at a center where we sequence many of our patients. It's not available everywhere, and it's hugely expensive, but it will get less expensive. It will be more widely used. And it comes back to the concept that I mentioned a few slides ago. When we know someone has CTLA-4 deficiency, we know what drugs are going to work for their autoimmune disease. But that's true for a number of conditions. I picked out CTLA-4 because I think it's the most beautiful example, but it actually turns out to be true for a number of diseases. We're not smart about every disease, but we're getting smarter all the time. So what is this treatment? What are we talking about? So I mentioned bone marrow transplant, and I'm going to put that aside. But I just want to say again, we understand that autoimmune disease represents a threat to the health of immune deficient patients. But we know that untreated autoimmune disease is an equal threat to the health of people with primary immune deficiency. So how do we do this? You have to balance the immune suppression and the anti-inflammatories with the health of the patient living with PI. But we have more tools than ever. It used to be that we needed a giant sledgehammer to treat autoimmune disease, but that's not true now. We have so many more tools. We have very specific treatments that target just one little part of the immune system. So we have inhibitors of T cells, B cells, cytokines, receptors. Um, there's not a lot of data on their use in the PI community, but boy, are we getting there fast. We're learning a lot. And I just want to say I haven't talked about IVIG, but it's actually anti-inflammatory. And you might be surprised to learn that if you look at the mass of IVIG that's sold in the United States, more is sold for the treatment of autoimmune disease than is sold for the treatment of PI. It's actually pretty darned effective as an anti-inflammatory drug. So I'm going to end with this slide, and that's trying to think about patients as individuals. It's one thing to go to a textbook and read about common variable, read about XLA, and to say these patients have autoimmune disease. It's another thing to be able to treat patients very specifically, either because we know something unique about their genes, something unique about their history, something about their story that tells us how to treat them better. That's really the concept behind precision medicine. In instead of treating patients as belonging to a bucket or a chapter in a textbook, treat each patient as an individual, and that is never, never more true than PI. Each PI person is an individual, either because of their genes, because of their story, because of their complications, and that requires very carefully tailored therapy. So I'm just going to end with colitis, which is where I started. So I co-direct a clinic with a gastroenterologist that treats colitis in people with PI. We've learned a ton. We have more to learn, though. So again, I'm going to come back to this concept of genes. If we know the gene, we know what treatment for the colitis. It's been enormously illuminating, and it's been very empowering, and we have changed people's lives. It's been incredibly gratifying. There are some new strategies. So we use some IL-1-directed therapy for colitis. This is a cytokine that causes inflammation. Not, this therapy is not widely used in PI, but actually has been very, very helpful for colitis. Maybe it could also be used for arthritis. Maybe it could be used for lung disease. It's time to start getting brave and trying some of these things. 
If we see a lot of lymphocytes on a biopsy, then we go to sirolimus, this drug that we're using for CTLA-4 deficiency. And again, the same concept, we're using the gene to help us figure out what treatment is right for that patient. So I'm going to end there and just say, you might want to help this process. You might want to help us figure out what's working. You got to tell us what works. So think about signing up for PI Connect if you have autoimmune disease so we can hear your voice, so we can hear what's worked for you and what didn't work for you. That may help the next person. You might help make us all smarter. So please think about it because I think as a group we can all be a lot smarter and we can move the ball forward together. So thank you. I have questions. I have answers. I have the questions. You have the answers. <laughs> then you have to read the handwriting. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh-oh. Last okay. minute. Last minute entry. Wait, I'll do the last minute one. Because she ran up so enthusiastically. She did, didn't she? So oh. what probiotics do you recommend for teenagers? This is super easy. We, there has never been a head-to-head -head comparison of different probiotics. Zippo idea. None at all. All right, does IG therapy skew the results of the results for autoimmune testing? Example, RA or lupus. Excellent question. Um, they can. And actually, one of the more frustrating things is that while rheumatologists at their heart are immunologists, they just don't think about things like this. So um, I'm trained in rheumatology, so I can say that. Uh, but rheumatologists often don't stop and think about immunoglobulin swamping out the results. And, and that many of the tests that are based on IgG results are actually driven by the IVIG product, not the patient. So important to speak up if you're in that situation and if your rheumatologist isn't sure, have them reach out. There's not a single person that you've met here who wouldn't happily help educate. Is it common for a CVID patient to develop a chronic kidney disease? Would CVID be the cause of that chronic kidney disease? That's a great question. So there's not a big signal for kidney disease. You may be aware, whoever asked the question, that in the old days, there was a signal of damage from immunoglobulin products. The immunoglobulin products at that time had a lot of sugar in them. It was a very difficult load for the kidney to filter, and there could be some damage. Not usually chronic kidney disease. So there's not a big signal for kidney disease today in CVID. Doesn't mean yours isn't related to CVID, but it's not a common thing. How does the rate of arthritis in XLA patients compare to the general population? Oh, I'm all over this one because I have arthritis. So um, <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis is 1% in the general population. So XLA is clearly higher because it was 11 to 15. What does the ANA lab results reveal about autoimmune disease? Does a negative or normal ANA completely rule out autoimmune disease? Um, tougher question. Now you're warming me up a little bit. Um, so uh, let's just define ANA. How many people have had an ANA test at some point done? Okay, a lot. So ANA stands for anti-nuclear antibody. It is characteristically seen in lupus, so it's one of the key features of lupus. You can certainly have lupus without having a positive ANA, although that's uncommon. But to come at it from the other side, about 20% of women between the ages of 20 and 40 have a positive ANA. So positive ANAs are very common in the general population, so they're not really diagnostic of anything. If the ANA level is super high and someone has uh, symptoms that are suggestive of lupus, then it can be sort of the one thing that gets you to the diagnosis. But on its own, it doesn't diagnose anything. Is an elevated GAD65 indicative to getting certain autoimmune diseases, for example, type 1 diabetes as an adult? Okay, more challenging. <laughs> so GAD65 is a characteristic autoantibody that is seen before someone develops diabetes. Um, I didn't talk about this very much, but there's a kind of anticipation to developing most autoimmune diseases. And what do I mean by that? There's a phase when someone has broken tolerance, meaning they have some autoreactive cells. There's a phase where autoantibodies are detectable that predates the onset of the disease. For lupus, the disease I know best, it's about six to eight years. For diabetes, it can be anywhere from three to 15 years. So you get autoantibodies well before you get the disease. And GAD65 is used in families that have a lot of insulin-dependent diabetes. 
to sort of figure out who's at high risk for the subsequent development of diabetes. So GAD65 is strongly associated with insulin-dependent diabetes, not other autoimmune diseases, and is most correctly used in the setting where the family already has a lot of diabetes, and they're trying to figure out who else in the family is at risk. Are you aware of any connection between immunodeficiency, for example, CVID, and Guillain-Barre syndrome, where one's immune system attacks one's nervous system? Um, excellent, excellent question. So um, Guillain-Barre is a very um, devastating disease where people will wake up one morning and their feet are a little weak, and then later on in the week they're weak in the knees, and later on, so it's an ascending type of paralysis. It's really horrifying. Guillain-Barre is driven largely by infection. It's driven by, it's the same old concept. It's driven by a B cell that's trying to help get rid of an infection, and along the way it makes a mistake. Interestingly, GI infections are the strongest drivers of the risk for Guillain-Barre. So while there's not a big signal of Guillain-Barre in CVID, indeed just following on this concept that in CVID all autoimmune disease is increased in frequency, then yes, if you take that conceptually, then yes, Guillain-Barre I would expect to be increased in folks with CVID. How is specific antibody deficiency in IgG3, Crohn's, related or is there a relationship? I'm so glad you asked that question. So there is a woman at Baylor who is trying to understand specific antibody deficiency better. We have a fair bit of literature on CVID. We have a fair bit of literature on XLA. Specific antibody deficiency is almost as common. It's more common than XLA, a little bit less common than CVID. We know almost nothing about the association of autoimmune disease and specific antibody deficiency. It's really a crime. Part of the problem is, is that the definition hasn't been very good. It's been a little squishy. It's been hard to kind of hang your hat on. Um, I think this is a very fruitful area for research, and you'll be pleased to hear that Dr. Hajar at Baylor is collecting a large series of people with specific antibody deficiency, and I saw her questionnaire. She actually is asking about autoimmune disease specifically to try and get a handle on what the relationship is. So I don't have an answer for you now, but I'm actually really excited that Dr. Hajar has taken this on. What autoimmune diseases are related to decreased cortisol levels and also regulation of the body's temperature? Oh. <laughs> oh, you might have found stumped the speaker now. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Colleen was working on this. I could, I could see her. Um, okay, so decreased cortisol level is a diagnostic of an autoimmune disease called Addison's. You may have heard that President John F. Kennedy had Addison's disease. Um, it is an autoimmune disease, and it is associated with low cortisol levels. So again, in the same concept that people with CVID have an increased risk of all autoimmune disease, then I would say yes. Addison's is actually a little bit different. So there are a couple of these single gene defects that are specifically associated with Addison's. And so this might be a circumstance where I would think more about some of those single gene defects. Um, and uh, when you have, the second part of the question was regulation of body temperature. When you have Addison's disease, your body temperature is low and it's hard for you to get warm. So I think that's all part of the same story. So I don't have a precise answer for you, but I will say that there are, I can name, I think, four single gene defects that are quite strongly associated with Addison's. So this might be one circumstances where sequencing would have a big payoff for you. If T cells are low, but function is normal, for example, PHA, does the person still have a higher rate of autoimmunity? Yes. Um, even when the T cells are low but functionally normal, because we're asking those T cells to work a little bit harder, yes, the rate of autoimmunity goes up. You might have, um, it probably went by too fast, but one of the syndromes that I listed was DeGeorge syndrome, where there's a pure quantitative defect in T cell production, but the actual T cells themselves work fine. That's probably the scenario where we have the best data on low T cell numbers in autoimmune disease, and the rate of autoimmunity is about 15 to 20 percent. So again, a very significant risk for autoimmune disease. Could all autoimmune diseases, for example, type 1 diabetes, scleroderma, can they all be caused by an immunodeficiency error problem? Um, so type 1 diabetes is pretty strongly associated with primary immune deficiency. I have not seen any reports of scleroderma. Now, that might just be my lack, um, but I don't, although scleroderma, 
scleroderma is immunologically mediated and there may well be an association. It certainly makes sense that there would be. I can't say I've actually read a paper describing that association, so I don't have a great answer for you. Is there any research on treating PI patients who have sojourn syndrome with rituximab? Oh, great question. So uh, rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that basically whacks the B cells. And you might think that that's not a smart thing to do in someone who's immune deficient. It's actually a, a very growing therapy for patients with PI. If you already have an antibody problem, you don't really end up much behind because you've been given rituximab. It has relatively few side effects. I actually like using rituximab for autoimmune disease, and it's actually extremely effective in Sjogren's syndrome, but I use it across a broad swath of different autoimmune diseases, and it is very effective. How can autoimmune diseases get diagnosed, especially arthritis in PI patients? I'm seronegative for everything I've been tested for, but my joints hurt. Um, well, not every type of arthritis is seropositive. So as an example, psoriatic arthritis is notorious for having no detectable autoantibodies. Arthritis is a clinical diagnosis. So I mentioned that I trained as rheumatology and I, I um, am channeling my mentor here because he worked really hard to instill in me that it's not all about lab work, it's not all about numbers. You have to examine the patient. If you feel a hot joint, it's a hot joint and it's arthritis. And uh, I feel Ed Sills would uh, enjoy hearing me say that because it took him maybe two years to instill that into me. But it's true. Arthritis is a clinical diagnosis. You don't have to have an autoantibody. You're going to have to help me on this one. Why are risk factors elevated? Graydon? Glyden? And elevated Lipton considered risk factors for RA. Oh. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question. I'm so sorry you found that one. What were you doing? Sorry. I, um, I feel like I should know something about leptin. Um, I don't have an answer. A lep having dysfunctional leptin is a risk factor for immunologic problems, but I actually don't know the data well on autoimmunity. I'm sorry. Oh, don't let me end with a downer. Okay, well, this one's easy. When you have several autoimmune disorders, see several doctors and take numerous medications, which doctor should be the captain of the ship? What am I going to say here? Come on. I'm trained as a rheumatologist. I function like an immunologist. Come on. I'm going to piss off someone no matter what I say. But I I'm, you know, I'm trying my best. I'm going to say you're immunologist. And I say that because as much as I love rheumatologists, and I do love them deeply, I think that immunologists are a little better positioned to understand this delicate balance that needs to be achieved therapeutically and I think a little bit better able to understand why some lab tests don't perform as well in people with PI. So I'm going to come down on the side of the immunologist. Is subcutaneous IG also anti-inflammatory? That is a great question, and there's actually precious little data out there. There's um, a couple of studies looking at autoimmune neurologic conditions where it seems to be just as effective as IVIG. Our sense, and I use that in the broadest term in immunology, is that that's not true for autoimmune cytopenias, but there's actually no data out there. This is another opportunity for you to get your voice into the mix and help us understand what's working and what's not working in PI, because the data is really in other patient settings. In Italy, brain stimulation has been used to stimulate bacterial growth in the gut, which boosts the immune system. Is it used here? So I'm loving this question, and um, it's because a friend of mine when I was a PhD student used to study this specific phenomenon. So it turns out that your vagus nerve, which is the thing that uh, goes awry if you ever faint, it's the thing that sort of, uh, when you're shocked, it's what makes you faint. So it's the biggest nerve in your thoracic area, and that actually has a huge impact on your immune system. Um, and in turn, your immune system drives your GI tract function. So they're all sort of linked up. Your vagus nerve talks to your macrophages. Your macrophages tell your gut to be healthy. And so um, that particular um, vagal nerve stimulator is not used for that condition here in the U.S. It is used for seizure treatment, um, but it's not used specifically for this purpose in the U.S. But I think it's only a matter of time. So great question. Very high tech. I think we're, Luke is waving his arm. Yeah, we just have a couple. Mom passed away of Wagner's granulose. Dad passed away of ALS. Has this contributed to my CBID? I'm sorry, first of all. 
um, really devastating diseases. Wegener's is a type of vasculitis where your immune system attacks your blood vessels. It's one of the systemic autoimmune diseases. ALS is not strongly associated with immune deficiencies, um, but Wegener's can be, not always, but can be. So this again would be a circumstance where I might think about doing some genetic testing because it's a relatively small number of genes that drive susceptibility to Wegener's and common variable. I have CVID and sojourns. My older sister has transverse myelitis. Neither of us had gene testing. Would that be helpful? And how do you proceed to get tested? So the genetic testing, as I mentioned, is really expensive right now. So if you send it to a commercial lab, it's about $30,000 to do sequencing from head to tail, so to sequence every single gene. To do targeted sequencing is usually paid for by your insurance companies, and that's more like $1,000. It's still pretty pricey, but it's not $30,000. Insurance companies are a little resistant, understandably, to paying for the $30,000 version. Um, there are circumstances where it makes sense. When I have mentioned sequencing today, I meant specific targeted sequencing where it's just one or two genes because that is, I think, available to anyone with reasonable insurance. The whole exome sequencing, that is another kettle of fish. But it will get less expensive. It already has, so we're getting there. So um, Sjogren's plus transverse myelitis, um, they're not, uh, none of the genes I can think of have both features associated, so uh, unless there's a more extensive family history than what I've heard with multiple people with Sjogren's, multiple people with transverse myelitis, I probably wouldn't pursue sequencing at this time. Diagnosed with colitis, CVID, and CNS brain lymphoma, are all of these linked to CVID or CTLA-4? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it has been one of the lessons that has been uh, painful to learn. And by that I mean patients where we thought they just had bad luck. It turns out when you look hard enough in some of them, not all of them, we do find these single gene defects. And when we find them, our treatment is much better. I say um, it's been humbling and sometimes difficult because I have a patient who was in my clinic for some 10 years. CTLA-4 has only been recognized for about two years. She had manifestations dating back 10 or 15 years. When she was finally placed on the treatment that worked for her, which was a beta step, she was able to do her job for the first time in about a decade. It, it was transformational for her. And I look back on those 10 or 15 years and feel terrible. There wasn't anything else to be done. We didn't know about CTLA-4, but I do feel terrible. I feel about all that lost time in her life. I feel about, uh, I feel terrible. I wish, um, although I'm happy to be treating her today and to have had a positive impact on her life, I do regret um, not knowing about it beforehand. So yes, those things are related, and if whoever that is that wrote that, I would urge you to get tested. I would urge you to be tested. Yes, CTLA-4 specifically. There's one other gene that can look like this, but much less common than CTLA-4. And last question. I haven't been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, but presently antibodies to my thyroid. Also have extreme cold, urticaria, and can't handle intense pressure on my skin. Can all of these be related to an autoimmune sense? I feel that they can be. I've been told that my B cells aren't numerous and are naive. Also have year-round low WBCs. So I'm going to answer the thyroid question. Thyroid disease, like the other autoimmune diseases that we've been talking about, sort of have this anticipation. There's this run-in phase where you don't have full-blown disease, but you have the autoantibodies. We know that urticaria is associated with thyroid disease. We know that urticaria is at its heart an autoimmune disease. So I would say, in my mind, these are all linked and um, probably linked to the thyroid manifestations. And the, the feeling of coldness, um, also, I can't quite put the skin with it, but um, when you have urticaria, your skin is altered. So I think it's easy to tie these together as being strange, disparate manifestations of thyroid disease. I know urticaria, urticaria is hives. I know it doesn't seem like it should be related to thyroid disease, but they actually are very strongly related. So it's easy for me to tie much of that together with thyroid disease that is evolving. Even if you don't, even if you're not on Synthroid or thyroid replacement yet, you may well be on that continuum of getting there. There we go.
All right. So if you could all uh, join me in thanking Dr. Sullivan for her excellent job. I was going to say thank you for the awesome question, so thank you.